All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, today's webinar, which is brought to you by the Bid Academy, which is the training division of uh, BidRight, Australia's big biggest bidding consulting company. My name is Mark Riley. I'm the GM of the Bid Academy, um, and I'm also one of the program coaches here at the Academy. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, BidRight CEO, Bid, Bid Academy program coach, and the godfather father of bidding in ANZ, Nigel. <laughs> How are you, Nigel? Do you want to say hello? Ah, uh, great to have you along. Uh, great to do these with you, Mark. Thanks very much. Uh, I look forward to this today. Excellent. Well, today's topic uh, is actually a sneak peek from our next generation learning framework, which we call the Bid Accelerator Program. And what it's all about is um, how do we use metrics uh, to develop an investment mindset in the bidding context, right? So just a little bit of a, here's what's going to happen in the next little while, um, our agenda. We're just going to think about have a chat around um, how to think with an investment mindset in the context of bidding. We also want to share with you a business model that you can use for strategic bidding, which um, we'll get into a little bit later on. And then we're going to talk a little bit around how do we take some of those concepts and improvement initiatives, such as in this case, that shift to a strategic bidding mindset, and how do we actually get that theory to stick in practice? So um, I'm actually going to hand over to Nigel, who's going to take us through the, the first couple of those, and then I'll be back um, just to finish it off later on. Over to you, Nigel. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, and I'll leave you to uh, bring in any latecomers uh, to the session today. Look, thanks very much, uh, folks, for joining us. Thinking with an investment mindset, what do we need to think about when we even say that, thinking with an investment mindset? Well, there's two key attributes, really, uh, of this. And the first of these is thinking more strategically in our bidding uh, aspects. And there was, um, so we're gonna do we're gonna a quick check of where your organization is. And a couple of years ago, there was um, a white paper uh, done by uh, strategic proposals, our partners in the United Kingdom. And they developed a concept um, around, or they, they surveyed a bunch of people around the world about how people think about strategic bidding and they grouped the uh, the answers or the responses and there was more than uh, a couple of thousand companies participated in this they grouped their responses around four ways uh, organizations think about their bidding strategy they an ad hoc approach to bidding uh, and see on the screen there how they think about that they chase everything that moves there's next to no proposal system there's no regular support functions and their low uh, their proposal quality and their win rates are quite low. The tactical organizations of which there's almost two thirds uh, did some reactive, uh, reactive bidding, uh, reasonably unsophisticated proposal systems. They certainly didn't have enough or insufficient uh, quality proposal resources on their teams, and they weren't getting the quality or the win rates that they really wanted. It was two thirds of organizations. And the, uh, the, the top quarter, we're in the strategic and the what we call strategic plus, and those organisations uh, really were had much more sophistication about their bidding activities. But it's interesting to note that uh, only a very small percentage in the view of strategic proposals went anywhere near the top, uh, the top one, which is strategic plus, where you had all of these aspects, which was a really strong, ruthless qualification process. You're highly proactive about your bidding, so. You led the activities, they didn't lead you. There was a lot of system about how they uh, delivered uh, and won proposals to be the best in their game. And we found that those, um, those companies were part of the, the DNA bidding, strategic bidding was part of the DNA of those companies. So without any other information you have, where does your organization fit? And uh, Mark's going to put up the uh, a poll. Thank you, Mark. And if you don't meet all the criteria, then you cannot tick the criteria on that organization. So I'd be interested to see where your organization fits. So submit the poll now and we'll see where we, where we are, just to get a bit of a, a barometer on the organizations participating uh, today. Good on your team. You guys are fast on the button. I can see we're up to about 64% participation, 72% participation, Nigel. So um, we'll give another four or five seconds, see if we can get a full on 100%. There's seven of you left. You know who you are. 
Come on, in you go. <laughs> All right, so we're at to 80. Oh, we're still going up uh, 84%. We're mostly there. Let's kind of, okay, going once, going twice, uh, going three times up to 88%. Done. All right, let's end. Let me share those results for you. Hopefully those are coming over loud and clear. All right, thanks, Mark. Interesting to note that uh, we are in, uh, yeah, not unlike where the... Um, in fact, very similar to the uh, the breakdown of uh, of the uh, the percentages at Strategic Proposals Hound. A uh, few of us are down in that ad, ad hoc area, uh, room for improvement. Uh, a large proportion of this group, at least, is on the tactical and, and strategic areas, uh, with uh, probably a bit more pushing into strategic, which is great. And we have one organisation with Strategic Plus. So again, that's pretty fits with the kind of the spread of organisations. So. For most organisations, there is opportunity and work to do to get to the next uh, to the next level. So, thank you, Mark, for sharing that, and thanks you people for uh, for the barometer uh, in this. So that's the first part of how you think about your organisations, and when we talk about uh, having an investment mindset. The second part of having an investment mindset is uh, basically about metrics, uh, because we know that, uh, well, we know that metrics and how we measure things are incredibly important part of organisations these days. So I just want to pose a um, quick question to you. Do you go to the, do people go to the doctor for a checkup? Of course we do. What things does the doctor check when we go to, uh, to those checkups? Uh, and I want you to put your answers in the chat. What do we check and how do we know if there might be something wrong? So answers in the chat. Uh, we've all visited a, a, a doctor. What do we do? Blood pressure, weight. Thanks very much. Yes, we are. What else do we measure? Anything? Blood levels. We've got it. All right. So thanks very much. Yeah, we do. We measure those things. All right. And we know if we're traveling okay by the fact that, um, hey, if our blood levels are a little, little bit low, if our weight's a little bit high, uh, we measure sometimes heart rates, the doctor measures their heart rates. We know if those things are off a little bit because the doctor said you're high, you're low, you're average. Uh, but there's a, it's a very, um, um, uh, it's, 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 it's numeric. So it's, uh, we, we have a very clear view of where we sit. So the metrics thing is incredibly important in bids and our view, our consulting view when we, when we um, consult with organizations uh, around the region, we find that their strategic bidding, their, their measurement of certain aspects in bids lets them down. And we find that those tactical organizations want to get strategic and those that go from strategic to strategic plus, the difference is in how they measure and what, what they measure. So um, with, uh, with that in mind, uh, oh, 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 Lord Kelvin uh, suggested, a famous scientist suggested that, uh, thanks Mark, it's me, I've got this. Um, I wasn't that working. We've got, um, uh, he said that if, if we, we can't, uh, we can't measure uh, or we can't improve what we don't measure. So let's have a look at what hold, is, holds our company back from a strategic mindset. And again, we're gonna look at uh, a poll here and there's various aspects that we hear about about what holding the proposal function particularly back in your in, in your organization organizations that were, that we, we work with uh, the first one is that we didn't even know that strategic or investment mindset having the investment mindset around bidding uh, was a thing we just react to bids that come in that sounds like a good idea we'll react to those things all right um, we find that our strategy in bids and our overall business strategy are not connected. We might find that, uh, as I said, we are react to those opportunities that land on our desks. Uh, with that, we have a, hey, well, we've got to bid it because we, if we don't bid it, uh, then we don't have a chance of winning. Uh, so it's the sort of the, the we've got to buy a lottery ticket type approach, got to be in it to win it. Uh, if we're not sure or it's something else, or if it's uh, nothing and you actually nail this investment mindset and have, or have the metrics that you believe, can uh, the bid metrics at least, to take your organisation forward, then we'd like to hear about that too. So Mark's going to share a poll, uh, one to six, uh, of which one of those best fits your organisation. We'd love to hear. So Mark, put the poll up. 
uh, and we will uh, see if oh, I'm over the shop. See if uh, this group where this group lands. So hopefully that's coming over now. <clears throat> it's coming over now. So which one of those things is most best fits your company? Interesting results. Might be some, something else. If it is something else, feel free to put that in the uh, chat. All right. There's uh, interesting results coming in. Oh, there's a, we'll share the results shortly, but a lot coming in where number two, business strategy and tenor strategy are often not connected. Isn't that interesting, Mark? Certainly is. Right. It's looking like we've got the trend there. So I might just end that and then I can share the uh, share the results with everybody. Just one second. Here we go. So doesn't, what does that tell us about bidding? Uh, we didn't know it was thing for bidding. Uh, I, again, this mirrors a little bit, mirrors the previous poll where we've got potentially on, on joining the dossier, the ad hoc company didn't know it was a thing and the strategic plus uh, says we nailed this and then everything else in between is uh, where most of the companies fit. And it's interesting to see that there's a spread um, across there. Hey, we've got to begin it to win it. We just react to opportunities and add on to this because a fair fair bit of that around happening too. So, hey, look, it's uh, it's interesting to note that um, um, it, 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 we have this mindset, we have this approach to bidding that really in, the, in, the, in most of the companies that we see and you've reinforced it here is that we can do better. We can all do better in how we think about bidding and how we how we approach our bidding activities. So, with that in mind, um, oh, Julius, with that in mind, we are going to look at now uh, a, a business model for strategic strategic bidding, which takes those two components. Um, it, it takes the uh, the necessary parts of being strategic, and then the metrics around. Hey, let's measure that strategy and see how that plays out over time. So we're going to give you a bit of an insight into one of the modules of uh, our Bit Accelerator program, uh, which Mark's going to talk about a little bit later. But uh, one of the sneak peek into one of those modules, and it's uh, it's talks it, that module particularly talks about the four key bid metrics that we believe is incredibly important for organisations to measure. They are the first one of those is annual contestable revenue target. So. What is your overall revenue of your of your business for the next twelve months? And of that, um, of that, then we uh, need to decide how much of that do we need to win through our bidding efforts. And it's typically uh, a third to fifty percent of our bidding efforts uh, of our overall revenue we need to get from bidding, depending on what, what industry we we are in. The second metric is proposal win rates, a pretty typical me measure for many organizations. Some don't even measure, measure that, but at the very least, we need to do that. The average contract size, and we'll, we'll see how this plays out and why that is important in a moment. Uh, and then the final one is a term we call bid investment ratio, which is the bid efficiency. So how good are you at bidding? How good are your systems? How well trained are your people? Do you have much process around this, this stuff? And so this, the BIR measures your bid efficiency. I'll talk about that very shortly. So from those four inputs or those four, um, uh, those four metrics, we then calculate four bid, bid outputs. And where, the, where we sit in, inside this uh, is why we're doing this is where we sit inside the overall business development life cycle. And those four metrics will key really play into our need to go up mark upstream into the business development life cycle into what we call positioning or capture um, or pursuit. Uh, people might not know, know that as. Um, and uh, then down back into the proposal phase, so the <laughs> opening period, which in this diagram here is between six o'clock and nine o'clock. But then proposal people or our bidding activities should also push up into the potentially the pitching areas uh, as well, the, the post nine o'clock prior, uh, prior to contract award. And we're finding that uh, from the bid efficiency ratio, BIR, the, uh, the benchmark seems to be between 0.5 to 3% of the value of contracts is what people invest in to win those contracts. 
So for example, you've got a million dollar contract, then you should be spending roughly between $5,000 to $30,000 on your efforts to win that contract. And that's um, mostly resourcing efforts. All right, so it's people people based. So five to three percent based on the the contract value, on the position proposing and pitch pitch phase depends on how your industry is structured. So that's the bid bid investment ratio part of it. So having nailed that, or uh, having that as a, a a benchmark, let's look then at the outputs, the calculations that we need to think about to invest wisely in our bidding activities. The first one of these is uh, the total value of bids we need to chase. And we measure that uh, by the, uh, the number of, um, uh, sorry, the value that we need to find uh, versus the, um, uh, over the number of bids or the average size of uh, the bids. And we'll see, I'll do a calculation so there, see how this plays out. We then need to work out how many bids we need to find to submit that. And I'll give you, a, again, a calculation to show how this works. And from that, we then determine how many bids we need to win each, each year. And uh, then from that, we find out what our total annual bidding investment is. So I'll explain that better by using an actual example. So let's have a look at a work example about all these things. Let's say you're a small to medium-sized company and your revenue target from a, a bidding perspective is $10 million a year. We'll do it from an annual perspective. Let's say you're a pretty average company in terms of win rates and your current win rates are around about 25%. The average contract size, uh, let's say, is uh, $2 million. So to get your $10 million, you need to find five contracts and let's benchmark our bidding investment ratio at this point in time at 2%, see how that plays out. Uh, so you can, the great thing about this, this example is you can add zeros on the end or take a zero off to, to get your, your numbers. So you can add two zeros on if you want or take a zero off. You can be a million bucks or a hundred million dollars. It's, it's the same sort of rough, rough numbers. How this then plays out is this. Let's have a look about how the numbers work. So how many bids do you need to chase if your win rate is 25% and you need $10 million worth of revenue. It's simply you win one in four, so you need to find $40 million worth of work to actually chase in bids. And if your average contract size is $2 million, then 40 divided by the 2 million gives you, you need to find 20 bids each year to bid on. And again, you can if you're if your annual contract size is only 1 million or half or half a million, you can multiply that accordingly. In this example, then uh, the number of bids to win, if you're only going to win one in five of those 20, then uh, or one in, yeah, one in four of those 20, then you need to win five of those bids. And your annual bidding investment based on that scenario is um, 2% of $40 million. Okay, so you're bidding on them all. So 2% of 40 million, which is $800,000. So to get $10 million worth of business, you need to invest $800,000 worth of effort to get that based on those numbers. What do we think about that? Uh, that sort of number to get $10 million? General rule. Any, 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 uh, any views on that in terms of a chat? Put, put your views on that chat. Small, large, indifferent. Not sure. All right. Well, um, here's a way to think about $800,000 to get uh, $10 million. Uh, in my language, is a pretty, pretty large investment. All right. But we see that that's where many companies actually are because not measuring these, uh, these uh, things. How can we do, do better? How can we do better with this? Let's have a look. Let's, uh, let's say that we could improve our win rates by uh, double our win rates, go from 25% to 50%. And we do that by being more judicious about the bids that we go after. We, um, we can be more selective and only go up potentially after those jobs that we're more likely to win. So do that positioning work, that upfront um, 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 return on investment idea. All right, is this worth our... Is this worth our investment? 
Uh, and then if we manage to have well-trained staff get good processes, have good systems, and we manage to uh, be much more efficient about how we bid, have good bid libraries, uh, for example, uh, use good software, then we can potentially uh, be more efficient about how we bid and, in, and improve our bid investment ratio in this example uh, by half. So take it down from 2% to 1%. What does that do to the numbers in terms of our overall investment? Let's have a look. Well, first thing that happens is we don't find, need to find as many bids to actually chase. So all that rats and mice stuff that are long shots, we, we weave those out and we only find that we need to get $20 million worth of bids um, uh, to bid on every year rather than the $40 million. Um, Based on the number of bids, I've got an error there. The number of bids goes from uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 20 million dollars. That goes from 20, not, not 20, down to 10, actually. And um, so that's not 20, it's an error there on that screen. Uh, we should proof check these, I should proof check these more often, Mark. But then the number of bids that we need to win, uh, five out of uh, five out of our 10 uh, is, um, again, is a lot better. And uh, our annual bidding investment, bidding investment ratio, uh, bidding investment is then um, uh, one percent of twenty million dollars, which is two hundred thousand dollars. So by just doubling our win rate, being more judicious, being more efficient at how we bid, we then drop our annual bidding investment ratio from eight hundred thousand dollars down to two hundred thousand dollars. Now imagine if you could go back to your boss and say, "Hey, I've got a way that we can save six hundred thousand dollars." Uh, from our bottom line next next year. And by the way, I'm happy to share 10% of that uh, saving. Are you up for that, <laughs> boss? Okay. So uh, we can then drive our, drive our efficiency and drive our effectiveness. So our win rate is about how effective we are at winning and our efficiency is our bid, bid investment ratio. So that then gives us a framework for measuring our investment, thinking more like um, a strategic investor for our business, if we potentially link our, our business strategy to our bidding strategy. I'm gonna leave you with that. I'm gonna hand over to Mark for the next uh, pace in today's agenda uh, to talk about uh, one part of that, which is uh, uh, how we get good trained resources to help us with that. Brilliant stuff. Thanks very much, Nigel. I can see uh, the odd comment coming in the chat now. So as we maybe as we move through the next part of this session, just keep those chat ideas coming and we'll try and pick some of those up uh, on the way through. So maybe Nigel, I'll get you just to keep an eye on those and shout if yeah. something dro drops up. So thanks very much. So let's, um, so what we've got here, right, is a concept whereby we want to, uh, let's say we want to change our status on that sort of quadrant of four uh, levels of maturity in bidding. We want to get up a notch by becoming more strategic. And maybe we want to implement that kind of model um, and discipline around metrics, right? So that that's the ask. And of course, now the, the challenge for us is to then, well, well how, do we, how do we do that, right? The theory is fantastic. I would imagine it makes absolute sense to most people. But this, um, this poor lady space says it all, doesn't it, sometimes? We might have a, an idea about an initiative, in this case, sort of building that strategic approach to bidding. But in practice, getting it done can be hard, right? There's all kinds of um, things that go on in your head when you, you, you come off potentially a course like this or a webinar or a training session, you kind of go, well, I don't have a say in that stuff. I don't have time for these things. How do I get stuff done? All these things. Will it make a difference? How do I know what will work, et cetera, et cetera? What do I need to do? So, so really the challenge, and I guess in this context of how do we describe uh, drive that strategic change, but it could be any other improvement initiative inside of your organization, right? So the, the options we have typically are some sort of upskilling or learning, um, or you can go and buy in the, the capability or what have you. But let's say you, you actually want to upskill your own ability and, and the capability inside your organization. Then at the moment, conventional training is the way to go. And by conventional, you kind of know the ones, right, where you get to take two hours, four hours a day, two days out of your busy working schedule um, and pop along. And there you take your nice brain with you. And then there's some inputs during that, that learning exchange, typically a high volume of content in a short period of time. 
Um, quite often it's kind of one way. There might be some exercises and and assessment steps and things like that. Um, and typically relatively short duration. So the, so the challenge for most of us mere mortals then is how do you actually retain all that stuff so that when it comes out the other side, we've got some tangible outputs. Those outputs are kind of biased towards our personal interpretations of what we've learned. So it's kind of, there's this process of um, assimilating the data or the information that you've got, working out what's, what's my take on that and how does that work in my world, which may or may not take you away from the intent um, of the topic in mind, if that makes sense. You have to kind of use these skills. Like if you pick up stuff at a training course, you need to be using it straight away and using it um, regularly for it to become part of your behaviors and, and the way that you roll. Um, and what we find um, based on probably, I don't know, 250 training engagements, 4,000 people and things like that is, is that typically the percentage of retention of information is quite low and diminishes quite quickly. Um, the less you use the skill, the new skills that you've got over time. Um, and that's kind of the, and what all that amounts to is traditionally quite a low return on investment in that, in, you know, on your training effort, if that makes sense. So we're kind of thinking, is there a better way uh, to do all this thing? Is there a better way to, to get that learning process to become more efficient? So what we did recently was just do, um, we actually organized a a whole load of research into what motivates and engages learners, um, particularly in the professional services environment. And you may well have seen recently, we've just published this white paper. Um, we found it, we thought it was so interesting, we'd better share it with people and, um, and put it out there um, because we wanted to know what makes people tick when it comes to training and what, is, what actually makes the learning process um, effective. And what we learned was there's four or five specific things that are important to learners and, and to the effectiveness of the outcomes. First thing is that um, people want to do courses that allow them to learn things that are going to have a material impact either on their career and their business. The use of having access to experts to help nurture that, their thinking, to help them process what they've learned and make it make sense in their world is important. Flexibility in this day and age, if I said to everybody, how are you today? Probably 85% would say I'm busy. It seems to be the most common answer to that question these days and everybody is busy. And so learning to, and, and also your brain isn't necessarily receptive to, to information at the time that the training courses are available, right? So being able to learn when you're ready to receive the data is kind of, is a key thing that we know is increasing effectiveness. And interestingly enough, with the prevalence of um, online learning through COVID and things like that, there's been a recent, flourish of the number of courses where you can you can go on self-learning and you can you can do that yourself um, with, in isolation and pick up new skills but what the research told us is actually human beings are naturally community people and they want to be in a community together and when you look go through a learning process as a cohort uh, then that's a real positive in terms of embedding uh, the understanding and in and in particular applying new concepts to specific um, situations. The last couple are kind of um, having time to absorb and practice the skills. So um, like we were saying before with conventional learning, a lot of stuff all at the same time, and then you go away and you may, you may apply small percentages of it. And that directly um, affects the retention of what, uh, of what you've learned and therefore the results that you're likely to get from it. And the other thing that we've, um, the research tells us is important is to break that learning down into bite-sized progressive chunks. So that's kind of, we kind of took that, um, the outcomes of that research and sort of back analyzed our training courses and how do we think about training and the learning process to, to actually come up with more of a, a, a learning framework rather than actual um, learning uh, courses per se. So on the left-hand side, all the things that we know are important, those same things that came out of the white paper research. On the right-hand side, our, our bit accelerator, which we call actually a next generation learning framework, because it's a lot, a lot more than just a course, has got these things in it, right? So, um, and they're directly in there or deliberately in there in order to provide all of the ingredients that we, um, we know will help learning become more effective. So there's a personal action plan at the top. Um, and the idea is there you capture what it is that you're, you're taking out of a training um, event 
uh, building it into a plan and and formulating your future as you like in, a, in an organized systematic way. Live coaching sessions, online learning management systems, which allow you to get to the content when you wanna to get to it. Um, having a, a, a cohort of peers going through a program together um, and giving time, right? That's probably the key thing, providing time um, and bite-sized pieces of, of learning or content or concepts. So in the, in the example Nigel was talking to before, how important is a strategic mindset? What do I need to do? How do I get that embedded, right? So you can actually, um, if you think about the learning experience in a different way, take that concept, um, learn everything you can do about it inside the program, go off and try it in your, in your business and come back and test drive it with your coaches. So that was a the theory. Um, just a little bit more about how it works. Um, so we've essentially looking to provide a whole load of, um, learning across all parts of the sales cycle that help you to pick and choose the outcomes that you want within a, over a 12 week period. So we've broken, like we were saying before, broken it down into modules. Um, the first four of these are what we call the positioning module. And what we were talking about today is that, uh, as Nigel said, the understanding of key bid metrics being the first of, of the 12. And at the start, we set up your 90 day action plan. And as you work through those modules, the idea is that you're filling up your action plan uh, with things that you wanna do. So item one there might be, hey, I love that investment mindset stuff. I'm gonna take that away and work out how to do it in my business. And then the, the next load of modules are around bidding, planning and preparation. So there might be some specific outcomes from that. Uh, and then the final ones are all around understanding and communicating value, right? So. So the idea is at the end of the, the program, you've been building and working on your 90 day action plan, which is your vehicle for driving, driving results. And all the way your program coaches on hand to help you uh, embed your concepts. Um, there's probably, dare I say out loud, about 60 or 70 years worth of experience in the bidding space available to you at any one time. And lots of experience in embedding this type of change in major corporates, minor small businesses and things like that. So, so the purpose of that is to help you um, get your action plan online and help you get actually get it done during the course and beyond the, the initial program. At the end of the program, uh, for those that love a badge, uh, we give you a micro credential. It's driven by a system, uh, sorry, an organization called um, Credly. Uh, which is fantastic. Anyone, you can use this on your own uh, LinkedIn pages, CVs, that type of stuff. And, and whoever clicks on that will be taken to this page inside of the Credly world, which tells other people what you actually had to do to get your bid accelerator micro credential. And we do make it quite hard, folks, just saying, because uh, we want it to be rigorous and, and extremely helpful. So just a little bit more about how it works, um, just conscious of time. So essentially there's, hybrid learning elements, as we like to call them, that sit inside the accelerator. And that is primary content exchange happening online through videos and exercises for a particular module. Then there's, like I was saying before, weekly live coaching sessions. We then build time into the program for you to try the concept in your business. And then we have quizzes and, and things like that to help you embed your learning. So those are kind of the elements. And what we're trying to do as part of the learning framework is actually to apply those elements systematically to help you master the skills that you need to drive change, right? So first up, you learn the content, like we said, then you um, share your grasp of the concept with your peers in the live coaching sessions. Um, you yeah, then go off a bit of time to go and try these things in your business, find out what's working. You might come across barriers, come back to your group in the live coaching sessions to gain further ideas on how you might implement this change thing through from your peers and also from your coaches um, and then a little bit more learning around quizzing and exams and that type of stuff just to super embed your concepts and all those things working together lead to a deeper mastery of the concept um, that, that's in, in play at any one time. So in our example today, it's around that process of driving that strategic mindset. So fundamentally different um, to conventional kind of learning as we're beginning to think of it. And the world is moving on um, and probably our philosophy is that shifting towards these modular hybrid learning environments is the way for people to get better outcomes, better return on investment from their um, training mindset, sorry, from their training investment. So that's kind of how we're, any, Nigel, any comments at that point? Well, are you all good? 
you also on mute, of course. Love your work, Mark. It's uh, it is um, again a, a different way of thinking about training. And uh, from what we can see and what we hear, there's not many people, if any, doing this kind of program around the world. So we've been running it around for about uh, a bit under eighteen months, and uh, it's a it's revolutionary in terms of concept and bidding and lasting lasting training. And we have a lot of fun in the sessions, don't we, Mark? In terms of the early sessions, and it really get a lot of engagement, a lot better engagement than we do in. Uh, in in the the, the, the robust uh, getting there and qu the quick training sessions, so we have a lot of fun with them with them uh, too. We sure do. So you don't have to take our word from it. We've got some; uh, they're a little bit small, but you'll be you'll be able to get a, a version of this later on. Um, but we've just been talking to the people that are getting through this program, and the feedback they give us is that they're really enjoying the interactive components, loving the hour of power, because this is the bit where they get to make it all make sense for them. And they're kind of referencing the practicality of it all, because there's theory, theory, theory. Everybody's in a in a, uh, a real busy world at the moment, and we've got to work out well, what's the most sensible things to do that are actually going to get me the results that I want. And there's other folk that are kind of loving the self-paced learning part of it. Um, and then there's other folks that just like the little insider pro, pro uh, tricks and tips and stuff like that. But my favorite is kind of this one that somebody said, Mark and Nigel were great. So uh, that's enough of that. All right, so folks, that's getting towards the end of the session today. Um, if you would like to know more about the Bid Academy program, you can scan uh, scan that code there, and that will take you through to a just a no obligation chat with one of either Nigel or I. There's nothing in that other than to say, well, where are you at with your bidding? Is it and to work out if there's if um, is, is the program right for you? Uh, is it going to deliver the results that you want? And, and you know, and we can sort of provide advice and, and guidance, make sure that there's a really good fit for anyone that does want to do the bid accelerator program. So after the call today, uh, email will be going out, I think, with a, a link to the recording, some more collateral and information about uh, the Academy and the program we've been talking about, and also some information, I think, about our, our next webinar. So um, just actually on that note, just watch out. Um, we're going to share some other bits and pieces from this program over the next couple of months. I think next month we'll do selling value, Nigel. What do you think? I think that's a nice tricky, tricky topic. And uh, in my view, anyway, is one of the biggest opportunities that um, organisations have in the bidding yeah. world today. Good teaser. Yeah, good. Love it. Love it. Hey, a couple of quick questions uh, to answer, Mark, as we wrap up. Uh, if you've got any other questions, put them in the chat now. Uh, two questions that have come in, and we might just answer those. The first one, uh, thanks to Nikki, um, asked, uh, can you repeat the bid investment ratio calculation? Hey, Nikki, we went through that really quickly. Uh, we spent uh, five or ten minutes going through it today with what we normally would spend a lot more time on, and you would get to watch the video once so and watch it over again. But very quickly, one, the bid investment ratio is, is essentially how efficient you are at bidding, and it's the it's a percentage typically between 0.5 and 3% of the value of your contract. So if you've got a million dollar contract, it's um, it's 3% you know, of that is $30,000. And that's really uh, your, your people time. So if you value your people's time at $50 an hour or $100 an hour, then it's 300 hours of time to get to your $30,000. So that's how that part of the work. And it's, it's we find that that bid investment ratio is not done anywhere near as sophisticated as most organizations should do. They just leave it to chance and say, we've got our resources, some resources that should bid on some activity over the year without typically measuring that stuff. And the actual calculations themselves, I think, Nikki, if you watch the slides back and work out how those work, then you'll pick up reasonably quickly on the calculations themselves. Hope that makes sense. Um, probably a bit of a go back and watch the video again uh, answer, but uh, very there. Uh, Sharif, come in with another question. How many hours a week would it typically take to do the course outside the hour, hour session? We find that uh, you know what you put in is what you get out of the, the session. Some people spend an hour or two. Some people spend three, four or five hours. And the key is watching the videos. It doesn't take much time at all. It's um, it's really uh, the doing the practicalities of it and how that concept or those principles apply to your organisation, 
having a go at that, doing the exercise, and then coming back so we can share that the following week and saying, how did you go with applying that in your or, or, or organization? So the answer to that question is somewhere between two and four hours depends on the on uh, you know the effort you want to put in, and the more effort you put in, the better off you are in getting out. Hope that answers that question. Uh, uh, Cherie, uh, Nikki, that's good. All understood. Uh, any other questions? Uh, any other questions that we have? Otherwise, I'm going to throw it back over to Mark to uh, to uh, close off. Excellent. Right. Well, there we are. We've um, run slid nicely on into port five minutes early. So um, thank you, everybody, for your time today. I hope you found something useful. Um, like I say, the code's on the screen. Just grab that. Just, just get in touch with us if you would like to hear more. And we will go from there. And we look forward to seeing you on the next session. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you.